Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, it is entitled the American Diabetes Association's Standards of Care in Diabetes 2024. And the webinar is brought to you by the No Diabetes by Heart, uh, which is an initiative jointly by the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association. Um, the purpose uh, today of this webinar is to highlight uh, the important updates to this year's standards of care and diabetes and how these changes will impact you as clinicians to be able to deliver better care for your patients. Uh, and there'll be a particular focus on uh, the intersection of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic kidney disease. The standards of care is a, is a living document. Each year it's updated uh, based on all of the available evidence. And we at times will even update it within a year's period because there are so much advances happening in the world of diabetes. It's, it's intended to provide uh, clinicians and healthcare professionals, uh, patients, insurers, uh, researchers, and uh, all really uh, uh, interested individuals with the latest information and guidance on what the the best care looks like and what the recommendations are to be able to deliver that. Um, and and so uh, you can see here there are a number of resources lift, li listed for you, allow you to do a a deeper dive into all of the material that is made up of the standards of care. And we made a very conscious effort to uh, provide this information in a variety of different formats. I highly recommend downloading the app. Not only does it have the standards of care and a number of important figures available, but lots of other information of how you can access professional education in a variety of different ways. So I'd like to recognize the, uh, the No Diabetes by Heart founding sponsor, Novo Nordisk, and national sponsor, Bayer, for their support. Thank you so much. No Diabetes by Heart uh, website is uh, really chock full of valuable information. There are downloadable materials and support for your practice, uh, uh, guidelines, past webinars and podcasts. The current program that we're about to deliver here uh, does not offer any CUs, but it'll still be lots of valuable information. Um, and at the end, we'll be hosting a question and answer session. So. Um, on your device, look for the Q&A and then you can pop in your questions and then we'll take as many as we can at the end of the program. Here are the faculty disclosures. And uh, I should introduce myself. Uh, uh, my name is Bob Gabay. I am the Chief Scientific and Medical Officer for the American Diabetes Association a practicing endocrinologist, and uh, so pleased to be moderating this discussion. And I am thrilled to have this an incredible expert here, uh, Dr. Dennis Brummer. Uh, he's a staff cardiologist and uh, director of the Center for Cardiometabolic Health uh, and professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve Medical School. Um, he specializes in preventive cardiology, has a great deal of expertise also in echocardiogra echocardiography. And uh, he, he is in a way the perfect person to be talking about this issue because he is board certified in both cardiology and cardiovascular disease and endocrinology. And so um, he really represents what the No Diabetes by Heart Initiative is all about. So without further ado, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Broomer. Thank you so much, Dr. Gabe, for hosting this and for the introduction and those kinds word, kind words. I would like to first actually congratulate the American Diabetes Association and the No Diabetes by Heart team and Kabul collaboration with the American Heart Association. I think this is um, really a very timely and important collaboration to bring endocrinologists and cardiologists and primary care providers 
and nephrologists and all um, subspecialty groups to the same table and try to treat diabetes and its complication better. I would also like to congratulate the ADA for putting out these guidelines that I um, was privileged to be part of. I think it's fair to say that there is no other similar guideline that I'm aware of in, in the medical profession, which is updated annually and then biannually with the living standards and um, reviews every year the evidence to change management to current um, knowledge, really. So I think when I just present some of this today, I certainly speak on behalf of my colleagues of the um, committee, which um, sets these guidelines forth and has been spending endless hours working on these um, recommendations and reviewing the evidence. So I will really focus today on the cardiovascular disease and risk management section. That is a section 10. And I, I really want to highlight a few points. Um, I would say the key changes that occurred in the past two years, which have been substantial for the care. We've changed the blood pressure recommendation. We've changed the lipid recommendation. We've changed the treatment recommendation using cardioprotective agents. And we have also changed now this year <clears throat> Um, added some additional screening recommendations. So I will highlight those going through um, the guidelines, and then we will sort of close with a brief case, and we'll have some quizzes and some questions and audio response system where we can all participate in looking at this. So the first, and I think this is really one of the key messages of the guideline, comprehensive care is absolutely pertinent. And this has been shown in many lines of evidence that if we treat the lipids, if we treat the blood pressure, if we manage blood sugar, and now on top of that, we use the right medical regimen proven cardiovascular benefit, then patients with diabetes actually do very well. This has been shown in large analysis. And I think um, this is really key. So what we will discuss, I will go over a few points. We'll talk about the blood pressure, the lipids, and the um, cardiovascular medications for um, type 2 diabetes, and then again, close with the case. So in terms of blood pressure management, one of the key changes that we actually made previously or previously based on evidence was that the definition of hypertension is blood pressure above 130 over 80 millimeter mercury. And I think this was a key change based on a number of additional um, analysis and studies to lower the score. If this can be safely obtained and treated, then we would place a target for people with diabetes at a blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80. Again, if this can be safely done, that is always um, important when whatever treatment we do with our, our patients. Now, um, when we have people who we see in the office with maybe first diagnosis of diabetes and the blood pressure is 150 over 90, then I think we want to initiate prompt treatment. And as you're aware, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are the first line treatment for blood pressure management in people with um, diabetes and particularly diabetes hypertension, of course, coronary artery disease. When a patient presents with blood pressure over 150 over 90, we can actually already start two agents. And of course, if album, albuminuria or coronary artery disease is present, then we favor ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. If the blood pressure is in between 130 over 80 to 150 over 90, we can initiate treatment with one agent. So this was a, a major change. And terms of more aggressive management of hypertension, recognizing that this actually elevated blood pressures persistently over a long time lead to adverse outcomes. And treatment thereof um, is beneficial for people with diabetes. So let's talk for a minute about um, lipids, where we've made um, a number of important changes, I think, mostly shifting away a little bit from percent LDL reduction to really 
numbers back to targets, um, which I think is clinically more practical. Um, if you see people with um, diabetes and you check the LDL, I think it's just more practical to have a LDL target. So we, we, we generally think that people with diabetes aged 40 to 75 without cardiovascular disease should be treated with moderate intensity statin therapy. There is good evidence from primary outcome trial and large meta-analysis in people with diabetes aged 40 to 75 at a higher cardiovascular risk. It is actually recommended to consider using high intensity statin therapy to reduce the LDL cholesterol to a goal of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. So this was a change that we made previously year. And these are recommendations for primary prevention. So those are those people who have not yet had established overt cardiovascular disease and are at higher cardiovascular risk. Now, um, what we added this year is that in people with diabetes who are intolerant to statin, which we see not infrequently, we actually recommend now treatment with bampedoic acid based on the clear outcome trial, um, which has been shown to reduce cardiovascular event rates as an alternative cholesterol lowering um, regimen. So people who cannot take statins because of adverse effects, myalgia most frequently, um, we recommend pampidoic acid with a um, um, class A indication. Now for secondary prevention, those are those people who have established cardiovascular disease, the LDL cholesterol goal is now lowered to 55 milligrams per deciliter. And um, there's good evidence for that. If this cannot be achieved with statin therapy alone, we encourage early um, addition of non-statin therapy, which uh, usually includes PCSK9 inhibitors in people with um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If the LDL cholesterol reduction only needs to be is, is pretty close to 55, as that might can be used as well. So um, in, in people, again, intolerant to statin therapy, we recommend PCSK9 inhibitor therapy with monoclonal antibody treatment or vampidoic acid therapy for secondary prevention. There's less evidence for inclycerin in this class of people. So these are important um, um, revisions. Let's talk briefly about agents with cardiovascular benefit and kidney benefit. Those are the SGLT2 inhibitor class of medications and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which really have become now the cornerstone of um, diabetes, cardiometabolic risk management, those adverse outcomes that we see so frequently in people with diabetes, including atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, diabetic kidney disease, or heart failure. Again, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists are key treatments. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Briefly before, antiplatelet therapy obviously is recommended for secondary prevention. Um, um, the length of treatment for combined treatment with aspirin and clopidogrel and a lot of those people who present either with acute coronary syndrome or with ischemic stroke, TIA, how long should treat patients be treated with dual antiplatelet therapy aspirin or um, a P2Y12 inhibitor? That really um, should remain in the hands, I think, of the multi-specialty team, including cardiologists and um, neurology experts, because this um, keeps frequently changing. Now, um, um, in some people, we recommend um, aspirin plus low-dose rivaroxaban should be considered for people with coronary and or peripheral artery disease. Aspirin therapy may be considered as primary prevention therapy in people with diabetes who are, would be considered at increased cardiovascular risk. Um, now, the um, class of, as I mentioned, the class of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists are recommended in people with type 2 diabetes and established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, increased cardiovascular risk or diabetic kidney disease, and SGLT2 inhibitor with demonstrated cardiovascular benefit should be 
um, use in these people, um, in people with atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk and multiple risk factors, GLP-1 receptor agonist with um, benefit should be used to reduce adverse cardiovascular events. Now, what we also, and the guidelines also recommend is that you should consider in people who have diabetes and increased atherosclerotic um, risk or established disease combination therapy with an SGLT2 inhibitor and a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And this is mostly for um, additive reduction in cardiovascular um, risk. Now, as you are obviously know, type 2 diabetes in people with established heart failure with both either preserved or reduced ejection fraction. So a wide spectrum of heart failure, SGLT2 inhibitors have clearly shown benefit for mortality reduction, but also for symptom improvement, reduction in physical limitations, and quality of life. There have been several analyses to support this now. <coughs> now, for additional treatment, of course, type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease with albuminuria, ACE inhibitors, ARB, angiotensin receptor blockers would be first-line therapy. And on top of that, um, phenernone um, is selective mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist has been shown to reduce adverse cardiovascular outcomes and the risk for progression of um, diabetic kidney disease. People with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease aged 55 with additional cardiovascular risk factors, ACE inhibitor therapy or angiotensin receptor therapy is recommended. And in a couple of minutes, I will talk about screening for heart failure, which is very important. People with diabetes are at an increased risk for developing heart failure. In fact, the risk or having diabetes itself as a risk factor is already considered stage A heart failure, which means a person is at risk for heart failure. If there are additional structural findings, for example, on echocardiography or evidence of elevated filling pressures, um, then even in the absence of symptoms, this would be considered stage B heart failure. And then we use a multidisciplinary approach to use the right medications, including a cardiovascular specialist um, to treat these patients. Accordingly, um, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are the first line treatment for people with um, diabetes and asymptomatic stage B heart failure. Again, those are those who do not yet have symptoms, but have evidence of structural or biochemical abnormalities. Um, risk factor treatment is key, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptors, and beta blockers, as well as SGLT2 inhibitors, because SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to reduce the risk for progression from asymptomatic heart failure to becoming um, symptomatic. So this has been added to the um, treatment recommendations. Similarly, um, in people with type 2 diabetes and established diabetic kidney disease, phenerenone has been shown to reduce the risk for hospitalization for heart failure. So these are some of the um, changes. I think one additional recommendation that was included by the committee this year includes the risk for euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis in people who take SGLT2 inhibitors. Keep in mind that the Food and Drug Administration, as well as the um, recommendation for the anesthesiologists, for example, recommend holding SGLT2 inhibitors three days prior to surgical procedures. Um, and that is because of mostly because of the situation of fasting. So I think we need to be aware of that risk that individuals with type 1 diabetes, as well as those with type 2 diabetes who are at an increased risk for ketosis or those um, consuming ketogenic diets, which were treated with SGLT2 inhibitors, you want to be aware of the risk of um, ketoacidosis in those people. So this is one recommendation that has been added. So for general cardiovascular risk management, people um, who have diabetes and one or more risk factors, established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, 
heart failure or diabetic kidney disease. Um, we address many risk factors at the same time, blood pressure management, hyperlipidemia, antiplatelet regimen, multidisciplinary approaches, and of course, lifestyle modification. And then we recommend in the majority of these people starting SGLT2 inhibitor or and or a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular um, um, benefit. Now, in terms of screening, keep in, in mind that screening asymptomatic individuals for coronary artery disease does not improve outcomes as long as all the risk factors and cardiovascular conditions are appropriately um, treated. We added this year that in adults with diabetes at increased risk for the development of asymptomatic um, cardiac structural and functional abnormalities, and I, as I had just mentioned, these typically are um, echocardiographic findings or abnormal um, markers of increased filling pressures would be considered stage B heart failure to prevent the progression from asymptomatic heart failure to becoming symptomatic. Um, we recommend screening adults with diabetes by measuring the natriuretic peptide, BNP or anti-proBNP. Um, that should be considered with a class B recommendation to facilitate the progression and to allow early treatment um, of risk factors that are associated with the increased risk for progression to symptomatic heart failure. So that is a new screening recommendation. In addition, one um, once if you screen with BNP or anti-proBNP and it is abnormal, that is evidence of elevated pressures within the heart, then the next step would be to find out why that is and to make sure there heart is structurally normal, so the next step would be a echocardiogram. In people who are asymptomatic with diabetes in age above age 50, have microvascular disease or foot complications or any signs of end organ damage, screening for peripheral artery disease with ankle brachial index testing is recommended. This is an additional screening recommendation because it could facilitate a more aggressive treatment of risk factors and um, ultimately progression to um, symptomatic peripheral artery disease. So with that, we have um, about 20 minutes time to discuss a case to us kind of reemphasize some of these um, recommendations. And I think this is a fairly typical case. This is a patient that we would see frequently um, in the hospital and I will highlight a few points here and there. So this is a 51-year-old gentleman who presents to the emergency room with chest pain. And the patient has class one obesity. He doesn't take any medications. He is a non-smoker. He does not drink alcohol. There's no findings, no family history of early premature coronary disease, which would highlight a um, early risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Again, um, vital signs, a fine body mass index 33, consistent with a classification as class one um, obesity. And again, the patient presents with chest pain. So um, the electrocardiogram is shown here. And um, you will immediately note it that this is atrial fibrillation. There are some ST segment changes. and based by troponin testing, this patient rolls in for acute coronary syndrome. Um, so symptoms and biomarker testing and some electrocardiographical changes. So the patient is um, giving aspirin and clopidogrel. It's a dual antiplatelet therapy based on the troponin elevation and started with intravenous heparin given metoprolol and he started on rosuvastatin 40. And of course, this is a patient who would be admitted to the floor. So we would do risk factor assessment. And um, you will note that the LDL cholesterol is 145. And the hemoglobin A1C, which is a class one recommendation to test, is 8.6%. So this is a um, 
person with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes and hypercholesterolemia, obesity class 1, and an acute coronary event. So the patient is um, uh, prepared for coronary angiography. And here we have a question for you that I would pose if people like this present to the hospital. What would you think? How often, how often would actually the cardiologist maybe have an opportunity to make a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes? Or in other words, what percentage of our patients with acute coronary syndrome have newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes? So uh, the slide is up, and please um, um, post your vote. So the um, consensus is that this is about 30%. Some you know, vote for 50, 10, 70. Actually, the, this has been studied. And you may be surprised that this has been analyzed in the Triumph Registry, 2,800 people. And you will notice that prediabetes and type 2 diabetes is actually fairly common in people presenting with an acute um, event. So 70% of people with acute myocardial infarction have diabetes or prediabetes. What is um, one inherent problem is that half of these patients um, actually have new diagnosis of diabetes and prediabetes have previously not been diagnosed. I, I, I would like to point out that prediabetes is actually a fairly common diagnosis and um, is associated clearly with an increased risk for cardiovascular um, disease. In fact, about 60% of people with prediabetes may have coronary plaque based on recent analysis. So this is a pretty common um, finding. So about 70% of patients with acute myocardial infarction have diabetes or prediabetes, and 55% have newly diagnosed. So this is a very common finding. And the case goes on, the patient goes to the cath lab, he undergoes uh, PCI and um, drug placement to his left circumflex coronary artery because he has atrial fibrillation. He's given the chance to restore his sinus rhythm. He undergoes TE guided cardioversion and is now treated with triple therapy, aspirin, clopidogrel, um, a um, anticoagulation regimen, metoprolol, is had been added and now Ramipril is added too for additional um, treatment after his coronary event and he's on rosuvastatin. So um, one additional question that we frequently think about is if a patient we see in the hospital, um, maybe not particularly this patient or any patient, when cardiologists see people with um, diabetes in the hospital frequently we're uncomfortable to change regimens. And I think it's important for cardiologists, and I think we've gotten much better over the past years, but it is a window of opportunity for us to modify treatment of risk, which obviously people with diabetes are at very high risk. So this is a unique window to make changes. So I think um, when people with a complication of diabetes like cardiovascular disease are admitted, then we should um, optimize therapy. And that includes, for example, for diabetes using the right medication or consulting our colleagues from endocrinology to make sure that um, insulin regimens get modified. But if you look at cardiologists, and I, I can say this, I, I, I am a cardiologist as well. So how often is diabetes treatment actually adjusted when people present with uncontrolled diabetes and an acute myocardial infarction. So how often do we actually change the regimen? It's always, is it just maybe two thirds of the time or is it one time or do we never change it? Or we say, well, we don't really know, just, just ask the endocrinologist. So just post your answer. What do you think? How often do we, um, do cardiologists change the treatment in people with um, um, type 2 diabetes, uncontrolled type 2 diabetes admitted with an acute coronary event. About one third of the time is what, um, what the majority of people says. I like those 17% of you who want to ask the endocrinologist. So, 
So with that, you know, the evidence for that was published in Diabetes Care. This is older data. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I think this has probably changed now, but it's changed because of some of the efforts like the No Diabetes by Heart, where we like to make the cardiologist aware of um, being a major component and physician actually seeing these people with diabetes. And so we need to manage care. So this is, if you just focus on this middle um, um, dark bar. This is if the hemoglobin A1C is known and the hemoglobin A1C is available and it's between seven to nine percent, so uncontrolled, then in about 30, one third of the time would we change treatment. So in two thirds of the time, this represents a missed opportunity. But again, I think we've got much more, much better and much more alert and attentive to caring for people with diabetes in the setting of a acute coronary event at this time. So we've, I've shown you this before, again, these atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, high risk conditions, we optimize guideline directed medical therapy for all risk factors and we add medications for diabetes, which are um, beneficial SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. So this is part of the treatment recommendation. So at the time of discharge, patient is stabilized and SGLT2 inhibitor is added for treatment of hyperglycemia and cardiovascular benefit. So the patient follows up in the office and does well, has no further chest pain and comes and says, well, you know, he heard that Metformin would be the best treatment for um, his diabetes. So he's asking that, well, I'm taking um, this SGLT2 inhibitor at this time, and should I not be on metformin? So the answer is yes, you should be. No, you shouldn't, or we don't really know. So please post your answer. So the majority, 65% of people would say, yes, he should be on metformin. And, and this is what this is the answer that I would have predicted, and this is actually the answer that historically would have been correct. Metformin for um, many years was considered um, a first-line therapy. I would like to point out that the UK PDS 34 um, analysis in um, 342 people with overweight and type 2 diabetes treated with metformin showed a benefit in all-cause mortality. And um, this was really one of the um, key data points that led to making metformin first-line therapy for a long time. As I had shown you previously on the algorithm, um, the recommendations now are SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. And this recommendation is irrespective of whether a person is treated with metformin. And this is um, an analysis This has been shown. And for example, a large meta-analysis of six trials um, on which um, four um, SGLT2 inhibitors um, were used that enrolled a large number of patients and metformin use ranged from low to high between DAPA-HF trial and DECLARE-TIMI trials and showed that the reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events um, was the same whether people were on or off with or without metformin use. So the benefit is independent of metformin. And um, this means that if a patient asks you on an SGLT2 inhibitor, is he on metformin? Should he be on metformin? I think the correct answer would be there are better choices that we can use for additional cardiovascular risk reduction. And in this particular person, keep in mind he has class 1 obesity, which at increased cardiovascular risk is something we should consider based on um, newer data as well. So we may need to add metformin ultimately for additional glycemic control, but for cardiovascular event reduction, we probably have better choices. <coughs> so the patient monitors the blood glucose level and fasting levels are 130 to 149. So 
fairly recent, the, the, the um, reasonable controlled, but not quite at control, bedtime 190, which would be postprandial, slightly above the recommended goal. And um, the patient's wife joins the patient and asks whether um, she saw that there are these new injectable medications and is this not something that he should be considered for. So the question that I would ask you next, and this is this is this is the algorithm here showing you that on the lower left you can see atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk, which this patient would fall under. You use an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit. And if the hemoglobin A1C remains above target for patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor you would consider adding a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And this is based on, the, for example, a trial called the AMPLITUDE trial, which stratified cardiovascular risk reduction on people with a GLP-1 receptor agonist versus a um, trial participant was on an SGLT2 inhibitor or not. And the benefit, the cardiovascular risk reduction for major adverse cardiovascular event or non-cardiovascular death was really seen equally in both people who were on an SGLT2 inhibitor and people who were not on an SGLT2 inhibitor, indicating that the risk reduction is likely independent of prior treatment with an SGLT2 inhibitor, indicating additive benefit. So because of this, and because this is also, you want to treat um, the class 1 obesity for this individual, the patient is started on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So um, I think this is probably one of the most important slides, I would say, in this presentation. And I think this is um, um, highlights some of the important gaps between what we know works for people with diabetes, but what is actually happening in the real world. How are people with diabetes actually treated? So my question to you is, what percentage of patients with diabetes meet guideline-directed treatment recommendations based on current evidence? You post your answer, less than 20, 40, 60, more than 60, or more than 80. So the um, majority of people posts less than 40%, few say more than 80, more than 60. So I think the general consensus is that we can do better. And this is exactly the case. This is a large analysis published in JAMA. This is from 2022, looking at a large number of people. And the indicators of guideline-directed medical therapy, meaning using the right medications um, for combined treatment of cardiovascular risk, which includes high-intensity statin therapy, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers, and GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors, and fewer than one in 20 patients were prescribed all three evidence-based therapy. Fewer than one in 20. So there's a lot of work to do. I think this provides a, 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 an, a, an opportunity, but it's also for us to know kind of where we stand. And when we see patients daily, these are the questions I think we should be asking. Am I using the right regimen for my patient and what can I do to protect this patient from the future. So he returns about six weeks later, does well, is participating in cardiac rehab, does everything, loses weight, and the LDL cholesterol is 63 milligrams per deciliter. So um, with that, you wonder how are we doing for this and what is the next step for treatment in this um, person, you would say, well, he's doing fine. He's at goal. We say repeat a lipid panel, consult nutrition, add azetamide, or add a PCSK9 inhibitor. So what would you recommend to this patient? Please post your answers. Good. Consult nutrition. 
that's always a good idea. Um, adding azetamide, 10 milligrams, is about one third of the people had this answer. Um, few said the patient is at goal or repeat labs. 7% um, would add a PCSK9 inhibitor. There would be certainly nothing wrong with that. But the I think what would be a reasonable next step is adding uh, azetamide to this regimen. And this is because um, combination therapy um, provides additional benefit. And the reasoning for azetamide, for example, would be um, coming from the IMPROVED trial, which showed a risk reduction in cardiovascular events in people combining simvastatin with azetamide after a cardiovascular event. Um, the PCSK9 inhibitor trials, Fourier or Odyssey, um, also showed additional cardiovascular benefits. So for those 7%, the answer would not be incorrect. I think that would be an option. Um, the, we know that LDL cholesterol plays a major role in future cardiovascular risk. So I think at this point in this patient, either one of those would be good. Um, what I would like to highlight is in all of these three analysis, the people who benefited most and who drove the cardiovascular benefit those were the people with at the highest risk, which includes our people with diabetes. So that is why we want to be particularly aggressive. So um, azetamide 10 is added. And I think with that, I will open our um, discussion today. And I'd be happy together with Dr. Gabay entertain questions and um, um, I thank you already for joining and for participating. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. You covered a lot of ground. And uh, 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 if uh, in those in the audience, if you've not put your questions in yet, uh, uh, click the button of Q&A and ask, uh, put in your questions. Um, while we're waiting uh, to gather all those questions, I want to remind everyone that No Diabetes by Heart has several resources available at nodiabetes.heart uh, uh, website, uh, and it includes really a wonderful set of tools and a certificate program for uh, being recognized for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes for healthcare professionals. It's a great uh, multimedia way of learning uh, more materials. And so uh, we've got a number of questions. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with uh, several of these. First of all, um, I'll just highlight, uh, again, some of the, like the blockbuster changes uh, in the standards of care. And I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's the LDL less than 55 for those with cardiovascular disease and diabetes, significantly lower than what it had been. Um, and then also LDL less than 70 for diabetes and risk factors. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit, Dr. Brumer, on, on the risk factors that might uh, make one consider someone with diabetes to have a goal LDL of less than 70? Yeah, I think you know, the, the problem is that the person with diabetes frequently has additional risk factors, right? So I think, I think that is um, very important to, to consider. So when we talk about primary prevention, um, those who do not yet have, as far as we know, when we see the patient atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that um, how aggressive do we want to be? And this has been shown in a number of trials and a number of meta-analysis, largest meta-analysis cholesterol treatment trialist, um, for example, showed that for every 40 millimeter gram per deciliter reduction in LDL cholesterol, there's about a 25% risk reduction of adverse cardiovascular events. And we've never been able in the evidence to actually show a bottom threshold at which additional cholesterol lowering is not, is not providing further benefit. For example, I think the most impressive evidence in these 
PCSK9 inhibitor trials that I had mentioned Fourier and Odyssey, there were those now we're talking secondary prevention. Those are people who had cardiovascular events, but there were a few people who entered the trial with fairly good LDL cholesterol numbers. And there was recently an analysis that compared those less than 10, an LDL of less than 10 versus the 35 average in those trials. And the risk reduction was pretty much cut in half. So, so, e so we may be seeing even lower um, um, future um, um, recommendations. But I think, I think, in general, people with 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 diabetes are at increased cardiovascular risk. We used to say for many years of the past decade that term diabetes is a cardiovascular risk equivalent. Right? We've we've all heard that. <coughs> now, if we consider this, well the cardiovascular risk recommended goal is less than 70. So then we should translate that to people with diabetes. But there is direct evidence from, from actually um, um, earlier trials to support these guidelines. So really strong evidence for that less than 70 for uh, you know many patients with diabetes, uh, many adults. Uh, I, I want to highlight something else that you said, which I know is a a clinical question that comes up quite often. Uh, and I've heard it, you know, well, doctor, isn't my LDL cholesterol too low? I've heard that too low is not good. And and, and you, you gave some interesting data there that argues against that concern. Yeah, I, I, I think as far as we know from studies and enrolled uh, from evidence from, from, from large uh, cohorts and from our um, um, randomized control trials that um, there is no real there's no real health concern of having a low LDL if this if this is safely achieved with medications which are well tolerated we have to keep in mind that people may not be able to take a statin or may have side effects of azetamide or can't take PCSK9 inhibitors because of flu-like symptoms or, or nasopharyngitis side effects. So that's always, of course, something important to keep in mind. But I, I, I think the evidence supports lower cholesterol. Um, and, 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 and this this is now, if in, in this, term of discussion, I may want to point out that the high intensity statin use after an acute coronary event in people with diabetes is about 40%. So when wow. we talk about when we talk about now should we are we talking 7, 35, 55 LDL, the real world evidence is quite different because people are not taking their statins or they get lost in follow-up or they can't pay for it or, or the, you know, for a variety of, of reasons and barriers. But if you look at analysis, how many, what percentage of people with diabetes after a heart attack are actually taking high intensity statin, it's actually pretty, pretty low. So when we talk about, should we add a Zetamib or should we add a PCS I? well, we can probably, we can probably do a lot better if we just start with the basics. Yeah, that's I, I, a huge opportunity to start literally anyone that would tolerate uh, a high intensity statin in the hospital, right? Like, like many hospitals have this as part of their standing orders as a protocol for anyone that comes with a myocardial infarction. Absolutely. I think this is, this is, this is um, this is done, I think, in most hospitals. This is pretty standard, doctors. But then I think important, more, more, probably more important is the next visit when the person patient comes and sees their their healthcare provider. Um, then making sure that there's continuation of what was actually initiated, right? Yes, started in the hospital and then their first visit post-hospital, one needs to make sure that they're still on it. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm getting other things. Uh, heart failure. So some really new things about heart failure here and, and not just that SGLT2s are effective in, in preserved and, re and reduced ejection fraction, but, but the screening of heart failure. So um, yeah, it seems like this can affect a really large number of individuals that should be screened. 
Yeah, I think I, I think the screening becomes more and more important because we now also have a treatment approach that would protect from asymptomatic heart failure to symptomatic heart failure. And that would be the class of SGLT2 inhibitors. And if we know a person is at increased risk for heart failures, making sure to treat one of the major risk factors for heart failures is hypertension. And that's why the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers become such an important approach for, for risk reduction and management of hypertension in that population. So I think we can't, we can't treat what we don't diagnose. So I think a simple blood test is, is, is may, <laughs> may actually help here because it holds true that a normal, a normal blood marker for BNP or anti-proBNP is actually a pretty solid test to rule out heart failure. And it is common, so common in clinic that the, a patient may say, you know, I, I, I get short of breath when I go up a flight of stairs, right? So, and then you wonder, well, is it just deconditioning or is it just because there's other health problems, my knees, my weight? Uh, but then if you want to know, does this person actually have heart failure with diabetes, you can get, so the rule out um, uh, uh, um, um, predictive value is, is very high. So, and conversely, if it's elevated, I think you have a good reason to further test, make sure on an echocardiogram, there is no um, um, enlargement of a heart or diastolic dysfunction of the heart or systolic function, you know, that these things are normal. So I think, I think to recognize this because so many people with, with diabetes go on to develop cardiovascular disease, including heart failure. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a great test to rule out heart failure and it's important to screen people early because now we have tools to, uh, to, to treat them early. So why diagnose early? Because we have effective therapies that can prevent the progression. So that, yeah, I know that's, that, that's really important. And I, and I will just remind the audience that um, uh, all of these recommendations that uh, Dr. Broomer was involved uh, and a member of the professional practice committee that created this are also co-endorsed by the American College of Cardiology. Uh, so let, let me ask, um, you know, this question, uh, so someone with heart failure uh, and uh, chronic kidney disease, diabetic kidney disease, um, there are a number of medications that uh, they likely will need to be placed on to prevent progression. And could you just sort of rattle through those? Uh, because there, there are several, it seems. Yes, they're they're absolutely something. Like they are. It's it gets it gets complicated. I think um, those people who have um, symptomatic heart failure, I think we want to treat in collaboration with a multidisciplinary approach, including of course a primary care provider and a group of physicians, including possibly endocrinology for more diabetes and. Um, car cardiovascular medicine to provide these recommendations for, for treatment. You know, of course, in any person with heart failure, the first treatment is, um, is, is beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs for um, risk reduction. Um, those are added for the additional benefit of um, um, Napresiline inhibitors and things like that, ARNIs, so they are added on. And then, of course, we have the SGLT2 inhibitors. We have the um, um, spironolactone, phenarinone. And, 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 you know, in patients with CKD, there are a number of things we need to consider. What's the potassium? You know, what is the patient albuminuric? Um, should, we, should we focus Again, I think in a sequence of events, that's kind of what I had outlined the strategy we want to focus on. And, I, and I, when we treat our patients, I think it's always important to keep in mind, you know, um, avoid side effects. Okay. Uh, they, yes, these people should be on, a, on, on these 
complex treatment regimens, but I think that titration is really one step at a time. And, and as, as I, you know, in terms of the effect size, if you will, of a medication that prevents atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, cardiovenal protection, mortality benefit, hospitalization symptoms, I think the SGLT2 inhibitors are, are, are very high up in the, in the list. So there's a, a series of medications. SGLT2s uh, clearly have sort of the strongest uh, uh, impact uh, potentially and right up at the top. And, uh, and, and I think you make a really good point about, uh, in, in a sense, having our patients be aware that they're likely going to need to be on multiple medications, uh, but to do that sequentially to ensure uh, minimizing side effects. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's a stepwise approach. And I think for, for um, you know, this is really a time where, where it becomes a multidisciplinary group approach. And, and that's also highlighted. We added this, that this should involve cardiovascular, you know, care, because some people may ultimately need more heart failure regimens, device therapy, et cetera. So that, that, that's, but I think it's really a stepwise approach. Excellent. Um, uh, we've uh, covered all the questions that we have time for. And so I want to really thank Dr. Broomer for an extraordinary presentation that really highlighted so many important changes. Uh, I want to thank our, our uh, uh, all of you for joining this program. Uh, it will be available uh, uh, online, so feel free to recommend to your colleagues. Also, stay tuned for a survey that will go out, and please uh, respond to that survey by email. Uh, it'll allow us to ensure that we're providing the best possible uh, educational material for you to improve the care of your patients. And uh, this concludes our program. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for everything you do for people living with diabetes. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Gavi.